speech that I can tear him away from John Kessler. <laughs> Two people who have a visiting problem. When I, when I was in second grade, I told someone this story a moment ago. I, uh, I had Mrs. 50 for my teacher, and my mother showed up one day to, to class and, and found me sitting in the corner, separated from all of the other students in the class. And my mother said, why is David sitting in the corner? And Mrs. 50 said, he has a visiting problem. <laughs> so I introduce uh, Tom McHenry, who has a visiting problem. Um, but we are, we're very blessed to have Tom McHenry, who is someone who has um, many decades of experience as an environmental lawyer out in California, um, but who also has deep connections um, to this state and to this region. Um, and he has brought his skill set and his experience to here at Vermont Law School. And uh, uh, Tom will uh, share some short remarks, and then we'll introduce our, our next speaker. Thank you. David, thank you very much. And the best news of all is my remarks will be really short. But thank you, David. Uh, just an amazing group of people here. I've only had a chance to meet a few of you, but uh, I think you'll probably be able to complete the revisions to Act 250 before you finish your dessert. <laughs> Um, it's just a, it's an, and it's an extraordinary group uh, and a, an extraordinary amount of expertise. Um, I uh, first want to uh, see how many people in the room are graduates of Vermont Law School. So if you are, please raise your hand, including David Mears up here. So, okay. Uh, for faculty of Vermont Law School, I see one of them checking his uh, iPhone while I'm speaking. Professor Chevrolet, could you raise your hand? Professor Chevrolet is not hearing me. Can you raise your hand, John? Uh, anybody else from uh, faculty of Vermont Law School with us? Um, and uh, anybody who has employed as an extern or as an employee a student from Vermont Law School? Ah, there we go, okay. We want you to please continue to do that. We have an extraordinary group of young people and older people uh, at the school, very interested in environmental issues, very interested in land use issues, and particularly as the subject of climate change has forced us all to think about the ways that land use and energy tie to environmental quality. Um, our students are very interested in working with you, so look for that opportunity. At dinner last night, uh, Eli from our Career Services Office, when we went around and introduced ourselves, said that he uh, was here and he was looking for a job. He wasn't planning to leave us, but he was looking for a job for the students from our school, so we'd really like to encourage that. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, in uh, California a number of years ago as an environmental lawyer to look at a unified environmental statute and we got together and spent an entire year figuring out how we would rewrite California's environmental laws, which are about almost the same size as the entire set of federal environmental laws. And I will let you know it was a complete and total failure. Um, so I admire the effort to look at Act 250. Uh, if there was any lesson I learned from that process, it was that it takes a lot of time and effort and an immense amount of flexibility from a lot of entrenched interests. And I think one of the things we're exploring here at Vermont Law School is the opportunity to reimagine how we make our environmental laws work more effectively and make them better. Um, so I thank you for spending your time thinking about this. Um, I uh, also told a story last night about the fact that uh, Professor Echevarria and I taught a land use course here at Vermont Law School several years ago. Uh, I taught the California portion of it. It was sort of recent developments in land use, and we've been looking at some very interesting infill uh, and land use related measures as part of our efforts to achieve uh, uh, minimal uh, uh, carbon emissions in, in California. And John taught the portion of the class in Vermont. We had an opportunity to take our students up to uh, the State House and meet with some Vermont state agencies. Uh, and then we went down to Logan and got on an airplane and flew over to France because the third part of the class was French land use law. We met uh, with a uh, land use professor at the Sorbonne. We met with a, uh, uh, the equivalent of a Supreme Court justice uh, in Paris. And then we took the speedy train down to Provence and met with the local land use planning agencies. It was fascinating to see that in France they were facing the same kinds of issues that we face in Vermont and we face in California, issues associated with affordable housing or workforce housing issues associated with sprawl, issues associated with figuring out how you take the traditional local land use model uh, and expand it over time to take into account regional and statewide concerns. But we were very thrilled to be able to feature Vermont because it's really one of the two states along with Oregon that's really looked in any serious way at a form of land use planning that's more statewide, although I know from talking to many of you that's not been successful. 
Uh, somewhat amusingly, the administration of Vermont Law School referred to our course by a semi-French name. They called it Le Boondoggle. <laughs> well, that was the way we thought they were. Um, so that's all I want to add today. I just uh, want to welcome you here to Vermont Law School. I've greatly enjoyed being the dean. I'm about nine months in, so I'll only be able to call myself a new dean for another month or two. I had a wonderful moment this morning because I was able to use for the first time uh, a speech that I had, uh, Caitlin smiling in the back, one of my former students, who was on the boondoggle, by the way, uh, uh, Caitlin Hayes, uh, which is uh, we welcomed this morning uh, 22 uh, accelerated JD students uh, to the school. Uh, last summer we had 10 uh, accelerated JD students. By the way, last summer I met with them at the end of the summer and asked them how their accelerated program went because they're going to do law school in two years. They're going to work through the summers. And um, one of them said that it seemed a bit rushed. <laughs> they were getting the message, which is great. Um, uh, but we have, uh, if uh, we uh, entered 161 students in Vermont Law School this past fall, uh, uh, we are thrilled. We have 180 deposits already this year for our incoming class for the class that will start in the fall of 2018. And we usually get about 100 new applications over the course of the summer because you can now take the LSAT uh, in the summer in June and then apply to law school and start as early as the end of August. We also have a very robust master's program and an LLM program. And our online enrollment is currently about 100 students, and we're seeing that climb as well. So um, we're very, very pleased about the robust interest in the law school and uh, the programs we have. But we do depend upon all of you in Vermont who work in nonprofit organizations, work at state agencies, work in private law firms, work with businesses uh, to help us train our students. Only 10% of our students come from Vermont, but 20% of our students end up living in Vermont. And our students took the bar in 32 different states last summer. So they also go all over the place. So welcome. We're thrilled to have you here. Please think of how Vermont Law School can help you as you go through the process. And I'll turn the podium back to David. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. I'll, I'll now turn the podium over to Mark Kane, who, who all of you who are planners know well. Um, who's decades of experience in, in the planning arena and is the president of the Vermont Planners Association. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my job today is to actually thank other people, so there's a lot of passing the thanks. Um, as you guys know, or many of you know, the process of putting together a conference like this is very challenging. And VPA was really excited about the prospect of working with the Commission on Act 250 to, to understand how uh, changes to Act 50 might re you know, resonate with the vocal planning community and take into consideration some of the many things that Vermont planners are actually understanding and dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So when the, the, the kernel of this idea for a conference came out in the, in the VPA discussions, it really resonated strongly with the executive committee. So we are really excited actually about the, both the, the ability to put this on and to actually help facilitate this conversation. And we'll talk a little bit about later about what we're hoping to do this afternoon. But probably more importantly, we're excited about bringing a really diverse group of people into this room. And I'm really surprised. I go to a lot of planning conferences, and this is probably one of the most diverse groups I've seen ever at a, at a VPA event. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I also want to make sure we don't forget to thank some of the people that really worked hard to put this on. And um, on behalf of VPA, I'd like to thank specifically thank Peg Elmer uh, for all the hard work that she's done. It's an amazing job. Um, <laughs> Her and Kate McCarthy. Kate McCarthy also was an integral part of putting this on. They've done, both done a fantastic job. Um, in, addition, in addition, from the VPA side of things, uh, Steve Lotspeech, who is our treasurer, um, he makes sure that this all works out from an economic perspective. And Sharon Murray, uh, who is actually on the VPA working group for Act 250, which is a, is, is a group that VPA has established to gather our, our membership information and communicate that back to the commission. And uh, I'd also like to note that Sharon is our one, uh, Sharon and David actually are two of our new uh, FAICP members from the state of Vermont, so we're very proud of that too. <laughs> and we also should thank, you know, partners of putting this on were, were uh, Diane Snelling. Thank you very much, Diane, for helping to go get this organized. Uh, Donna Casey for putting this on. And obviously the folks here at the Vermont Law School, Rebecca, Martina, and Eli Gleason. Also, thank you very much for helping put this on. Appreciate it. 
So without further ado, I'm actually going to now introduce John Adams. And John Adams is the director of the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. And if any of you have met John or know John, you know he's a big fan of data and facts. And I think in this day and age, that's actually a really good thing to have as a basis for a discussion of policy. So John is going to provide us with some relevant facts and information about the state of Vermont that hopefully as we get into this afternoon sessions, we can consider in terms of some of these strategies and approaches we might take to changing Act 250 or modifying it. So thank you, John. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark. And, and Thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, I asked uh, Kate McCarthy at VNRC if she could send me a list of people who would be here so I could uh, understand how nerdy I could get here. And, um, and as far as I could tell, it's a, uh, this is a pretty nerdy audience. So if uh, your idea of a good time is not a barrage of overly complicated maps and graphs as you finish eating, uh, I ap apologize. So uh, going back close to 100 years ago, one of our first uh, planning reports in the state, the uh, Rural Vermont Program for the Future, uh, we had uh, two, two outcomes from this that I think, uh, or I know were, were uh, less than desirable, the first being eugenics, which we will not get into, uh, the second uh, being this, this recommendation and this big push uh, to build highways really without much consideration about uh, associated impacts with those. Um, nearly uh, 40 years later, 1968, in uh, Vision and Choice, the document or report that would lead to Act 250, we identified some of those uh, negative externalities that came from uh, the recommendations or those actions of the previous years. And, um, and we, had this, uh, we had this map that was made uh, and it has some beautiful maps um, in this report if you haven't seen it. Uh, this is a projection of our urban areas in Vermont in 1990 uh, if, if trends were to continue. Um, and it's a, a cartographic technique we call uh, scaring people with maps. <laughs> um, but a big part of the report would set really what our land use goals are uh, up until today, and that's uh, really looking at our, our traditional, um, our working landscape surrounded by uh, compact settlements. Um, and, and this report, again, really set the way for, for Act 250 and trying to, to preserve Vermont's landscape. Uh, this is our urban areas today. I tried to mimic some of the, the colors of this 1968 uh, map. Uh, thankfully, uh, we did not see the urban expansion or urban growth as was uh, projected. Um, I don't think it was ever possible for that to happen, but I think in, in we have to acknowledge that uh, things would likely be a lot worse if it wasn't for Act 250. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of our development patterns, maybe why some of them are happening, some of the opportunities, challenges we have here in Vermont. Before I do that, I'll just touch upon a few, or ask the question, you know, should our land use policy promote this traditional rural scene and, and concentrated settlements that we highlighted in, in uh, 1968? And I'll try to talk about maybe elements of that that we weren't thinking of then or emphasizing and, and still don't today. Um, starting with this bar graph, which I realize is not doesn't look like the most uh, exciting uh, bar graph. It is a bar graph. I tried to make the bars look like roads as if that would make it more interesting to you, like you're a bunch of five-year-olds or something. Um, but it is uh, an, important, um, an important point here. And uh, it, you can't read the bottom. But what this shows is uh, median household annual vehicle miles traveled by different areas in Vermont. And to the left, to the far left, we have the exurbs of Chittenden County. Uh, next to that, we have the state median, so about 22,000 uh, vehicle miles traveled per household. And then to the right of that, we have uh, a half mile from our downtowns, our designated downtowns, and our neighborhood development areas. 
uh, which we're seeing households traveling with, with vehicle miles traveled of up to two thirds, one third to two thirds less than uh, the median in Vermont. And this is really significant. And we're able to measure this thanks to um, the Agency of Transportation and the Transportation Research Center at Vermont working with the Household Travel Survey to oversample for Vermont so we could really get location specific data and not just census data that's out there. Uh, what are some of the benefits of that? When you think about affordability, uh, annual cost to operate a vehicle in the United States is close to $9,000 and Vermont households, as we know, spend a really large percentage of their income uh, on transportation and vehicle ownership. And we often look at the medians, uh, but when you think about uh, giving someone the opportunity to live in a place without uh, a vehicle or without owning a vehicle, uh, it's really empowering. This is really key, I think, to building inclusive communities and having more people come to Vermont. So walkability, I think a great indicator of what, what types of communities we wanna build. When you look at energy, um, this is from uh, VEIC, over half of a, a household's uh, energy costs are associated with transportation. So living in, in our walkable neighborhoods or within a half mile of downtowns, you see a 31 to, uh, or 16 to 31 reduction in energy costs uh, for Vermont households. Health, um, can anyone tell me who this uh, individual is? Surgeon General Vivek Murthy uh, under President uh, Obama. Does anyone know what he's talking about? Um, maybe before, uh, before he started talking about uh, how we have the first generation of children in this country that are expected to live shorter lives than their parents. Um, and that's because of things like uh, diabetes, ca cardiovascular disease, and other diseases really related to inactivity. And he started a big campaign calling on planners, on uh, transportation engineers, on community leaders to really focus on building uh, walkable neighborhoods because we know uh, there's a, a far less prevalence of these issues in uh, neighborhoods that are walkable. Uh, and this statistic is showing that over the past 25 years, we have seen a 50% increase in obesity in high school students in Vermont. Water quality, so uh, a lot of talk about impervious surface in, in water quality in Vermont. When we look at uh, the amount of impervious surface inside of our centers versus outside in population and jobs, uh, one acre of impervious surface inside some of our centers uh, has about 12 people and 10.6 jobs compared to uh, five people and 2.2 jobs outside of centers. So you need about two and a half times as much impervious for the same amount of people in, uh, outside of our centers and close to uh, five times as many, uh, as much for jobs. Um, so that's, I mean, that's just a, a sampling of, I think, some of the benefits of a settlement pattern like this, looking at issues ranging from health, uh, affordability, energy, water quality. Um, now I'll shift over to, to ask, you know, where is development happening in Vermont? And this is an update to, to some numbers for a talk I gave a couple of years ago at a, a VPA event. So looking at uh, E911 points, when we look at new residential structures from 2008 to, to 2018, or to the end of 2017, um, this is showing the areas in, in dark green, those are growth outside of uh, centers, and in black, uh, inside centers. Um, we see not a tremendous amount of variation from year to year in where development is happening. However, um, and most of it is happening on the outside. However, this, uh, because of the way 911 has been uh, keeping their data, for multifamily units, they're only registering as one structure. So we're not actually getting a whole lot of information here. When we drill down uh, and look at some county differences, there are some significant uh, significant differences. And to the far left, you see uh, Chittenden County, uh, where you have a much higher percentage of um, residential development happening inside centers. And we'll revisit why that might be happening later. Um, when you look at new multifamily structures, 
the difference is, is uh, fairly dramatic here. Almost all multifamily uh, development is happening within uh, Chittenden County. And luckily, um, uh, CCRPC has been keeping data on units per structure as well as year built. So we can go back, what this chart is showing us, going back to 1890 all the way to today. And the areas in uh, green are development outside of centers, so actual units, including multifamily. So you can see as we start to, to build out the highway, the expansion uh, out of centers, uh, you see that dip in the late 70s. Um, and then when you look at between 1990 to 2006, you see about uh, only 40% of our residential um, buildings were inside centers. And then uh, post uh, crash in 2007, there's been a big drop there uh, or a big increase in development in centers where we see 60% uh, happening on the inside. You look at uh, commercial structures, uh, and it's worth noting that um, the, the uh, number on the, the far left, again, that's Chittenden County, um, that is only showing a little over 200 over 10 years. So we haven't seen a whole lot of new uh, commercial construction uh, over the past decade, at least compared to, to residential buildings as measured by this, this metric here. Uh, but a lot more of it is happening in centers than outside compared to our residential um, construction. And looking at Act 250 decisions, I thought it would be interesting to try to compare them, but uh, because of, for a number of, of different reasons, one of how the data is, is uh, kept and managed, and two, I just didn't have very much time to dig into it, um, th there really wasn't a way to make any sort of apples to apples comparison. And I'm actually not sure there's a whole lot of useful information to be gleaned here. What this showing is uh, minor and major applications, so it excludes administrative amendments um, by jurisdictional type. So you can see uh, a lot more in terms of uh, commercial applications being reviewed by Act 250 as compared to uh, residential act, um, applications. And this is showing from 1970 um, to, uh, to present day. So I think many of you have seen um, these maps before. They're dot density maps of population looking at uh, 1850 to 1930. And I think the story here is that we're moving from an agricultural um, society to an industrial one. You could see this is approximately or, or similar size population, and you can see um, on the map to the right a concentration of our population, right? You see it, it gets a little uh, lighter shade on the outside. So as, as our transportation uh, infrastructure and, and we get rail improves and we industrialize, you could see people coming in from our, our hill farms and coming into our centers. So I tried to recreate a dot density map of what, um, what Vermont looks like today. Uh, you can see a little more dispersion, um, a lot of growth in some of these centers and an expansion into the, um, the suburbs of, of Burlington. But this is, um, this is using some of our, our residential uh, data of where people live. When you look at daytime populations, I think it's a, it's a very different story. And in the 1850s, 1930, our daytime and nighttime populations were pretty similar. Whereas now it's very different and you can see a, a much bigger concentration of our jobs uh, in our centers throughout Vermont. Uh, and if you extrude those, those jobs into sort of a, a more modern 3D map as opposed to uh, 1930s dot density map, you can see here the extent of it, how it is concentrating in the, those uh, downtowns across Vermont. Uh, and this is a, a sheep density map um, and it shouldn't, shouldn't be, shouldn't be in here. Uh, <laughs> so um, what, what is driving these development trends? And maybe we'll start like, by backing up and looking maybe uh, countrywide or at a, uh, even globally, uh, what's been happening. So here, here's economic activity in uh, the United States split in half. Um, you can see that 
um, you know, despite these uh, uh, transportation costs decreasing dramatically and uh, the invention of the internet, um, that we, we've had an increase in concentration of economic activity and productivity in our big cities uh, and urban areas. Um, and it hasn't been equal in all urban areas. There's been a lot of work done by uh, Ed Glazer at um, Harvard University, as well as uh, Benjamin Chinitz before him and, and um, Carnegie Mellon, showing that uh, it's a combination of uh, population centers as well as uh, educated people and uh, entrepreneurial people as measured by a percentage of people in small businesses. So if you compare Detroit versus New York, for example, where you had a lot of small business owners in the textile industry, um, as opposed to large uh, companies, vertically integrated companies like the auto manufacturers, um, you, the small business folks were able to adapt to a changing economy. And those are the, the areas where we've seen the, the largest amount of growth. Um, and it's telling when you think about the company that's basically made, uh, they've almost made you know, place irrelevant in terms of the technology that they've um, enabled people to communicate with. Uh, instead of buying, you, you'd think that maybe you'd buy the, some less some cheap land somewhere. If you've got uh, great uh, internet access, Google went uh, and, and bought uh, some of the most expensive real estate in the country, right, in New York City. Uh, spending a decade ago close to $2 billion for the Port Authority building and then just a couple months ago buying another building for $2.4 uh, billion. Um, so what does, that, what does that mean or what does that look like in terms of settlement patterns uh, across the country and in Vermont? Well, um, and, and across the world really we've seen an urbanization happening, right? So people coming into these centers and depending on uh, housing supply, housing prices, uh, transportation costs, people will move out further and further um, into the, the countryside and commute into, uh, into their jobs in the, into the cities. And this, this is work done by uh, Alistair Ray and Garrett uh, Dash Nelson at Dartmouth who um, looked at our origin and destination of com commuting patterns uh, across the country here. Um, Transportation costs, I think, driving a big, big portion of it. Here in Vermont, uh, we've done a lot to make transportation really as inexpensive as possible, um, more than 47 other states. Um, our share of, of state and local spending covered by user fees in terms of driving is covered by drivers. So 75% of that is coming from a different uh, revenue source. So there's no link between uh, how much you drive and really what you're paying for that infrastructure. So um, thankfully, uh, Garrett uh, Dash Nelson has shared the data he used for, for this study and I pulled out uh, the Vermont commuting patterns and you can see here um, the origin and destinations of where people are working. And he, um, they ran various al algorithms to determine sort of what is the economic geography in terms of the connectedness of these communities. And he found sort of four, uh, four separate different operational sort of economic zones happening in Vermont. <coughs> you can kind of see illustrated here. So um, in th this really corresponds or it, to a lot of other data that we see in terms of loss and um, population loss in rural counties, where you can see the areas outside of that, that Burlington uh, metro area or commuter shed uh, starting to lose population. Um, here you can see for the first time uh, in the past few years, a number of different counties in Vermont are experiencing a, a natural decrease in population, so um, deaths are, we're seeing more deaths than we're seeing births, which isn't, shouldn't come as a terrible surprise that we've, uh, we've known about our aging population for a while. Here's a, our projected population pyramid for uh, 2030 in Vermont. And here's how this, uh, here's how this looks in terms of a thematic map. Um, and I don't, I'm not trying to scare people with maps here either. Uh, I should point out this isn't a dramatic drop in population. Um, 
nor is it a dramatic increase in population. These colors sometimes can make it seem like it's a, a greater difference than it is. But I do think I'll, I'll draw our attention to maybe some of those centers, like um, you even have like Montpelier, Barrie, uh, Virgins, St. Albans, uh, Newport, uh, Rutland, Bennington, all those areas in the darker red um, shade of the spectrum, which I think is something that, that we, should, we should focus on and see if it's something that we can, can change. So looking at opportunities, um, what are some of the opportunities in Vermont? Well, Vermont has some pretty smart people uh, by almost, I think, any metric. This map, I think, is showing us um, you know, percentage of population with um, university degrees. Um, and we have a, an opportunity to use uh, a lot of data and make uh, some changes in what we have control over. And I have a few slides that I've adopted from Joe Minicosi for Vermont. Uh, how many people here know who Joe Minicosi is or have seen him speak? He spoke at the downtown conference. Uh, awesome. So a good number of people, if you haven't, I highly recommend checking out some of his work. I think if you Google Joe and um, either downtown conference or uh, he spoke at the uh, Let's Talk Progress event last year in Burlington. You can see uh, this talk in its entirety. But so Joe is a big advocate of using data and information in terms of, of um, municipal governance and governments in general, particularly as it relates to their uh, understanding their, their tax base and where some of their revenues and expenditures are coming from. And he draws this example with farmers who increasingly are using some very sophisticated data and information using drones to understand what is the yield, the crop yield, uh, for what amount of uh, input that they are putting into their field. So a farmer will grow sort of the most profitable crop based on what it takes for them to um, put into their, their field. And if we think of our, our cities uh, like this, um, and we decide you know, what kind of crops do we want to grow in our cities, uh, it helps us, I think, think a little bit differently about some of the decisions we make. So if we compare uh, a mixed use, this is a mixed use building in Montpelier. Uh, it's uh, on a, close to a tenth of an acre, 16 apartments, um, with uh, my house on, on close to a tenth of an acre. Uh, and uh, a big box store, you can see uh, big differences in tax value here. Um, and this is maybe traditionally how we look at uh, revenue from some of these buildings. But we aren't breaking it down by area, right? We have a finite amount of space. Uh, we can't just create, we can't annex you know, part of New Hampshire if we, we want more space. Um, or we could try, but I think it wouldn't go over very well. Uh, we might have better luck with Quebec. Um, when we break it down by acre, it tells a much different story. Uh, so that mixed-use building is now, uh, we're yielding $150,000 uh, per acre, uh, as opposed to 4300 per acre for a big box store. Uh, and you look at the amount of infrastructure that uses, we're using far less for that mixed use development. So we're seeing a much bigger yield with far less uh, expenditure in terms of public infrastructure for that development. Um, when you extrude that in terms of uh, three dimensions using 3D mapping, it, you can sort of see that picture very clearly. And uh, we posted, um, Jenny Bauer in our office actually posted this at, at midnight last night. Um, if you go to our Twitter account, at VCGI, I posted a link to an interactive map, and we just uh, uploaded about 50 towns in Vermont where you can explore the property value per acre in, in three dimensions. This is uh, St. Albans, and you can see the downtown core very clearly there. And I want to be clear, these aren't like big, tall buildings. This is, uh, this is value per acre of our downtown, our traditional downtown streets. Um, those treasured assets, those, those nicest buildings that we have in our downtowns are yielding the highest value per acre. Uh, this is the Walmart in St. Albans that I've circled in blue there. And I want to be clear, I'm not um, picking, 
don't want to pick on Walmart, or I'm not saying like that they're a bad company or organization. I think, uh, and the way Joe talks about it is they're doing exactly what we've asked them to do and what we've set them up to do, right? Um, he tells the story of how one of the vice presidents at, at Walmart went and talked to the uh, North American sort of assessing conference and explained to them uh, everything that went into their buildings and how they you know, bulk purchased contractors and, and really how cheap it was to build these buildings and that they had a lifespan of 15 years and that they were basically worthless to anybody else, right? Just sort of bragging about how, how um, terrible these buildings are which is a really smart thing to do, right? If you can lower your t property tax bill across you know, 1,500 municipalities or however many they have stores in. And this is the system that, that we built. This is what we're saying. Like the worse, the worse your building is, the less we'll charge you, despite, regardless of how much infrastructure you're using. Meanwhile, if, if you're, you want to invest in some of our downtowns, the nicer building you, you build, um, you know, the, the bigger your tax bill is going to be. So it's not that, um, when you think about it, you know, we're getting exactly what we, we've designed for, a combination of in terms of our economics and our regulatory structure. A uh, few other towns in Vermont, I don't know if we want to play like the, the guessing, uh, guessing <laughs> game here. Anyone know, know where this is? No? Nope. Mm -mm. Southern part of the state? Bennington. Waterbury. Nope, smaller place. Nope. No, come on, guys. You know this. It's right next to Waterbury. Richmond. <laughs> I can't believe you didn't get that. <laughs> um, this one should be easy. Virgins. This one. This one is too hard. You're not going to get it. It's Reedsboro. <laughs> so you can see that this applies at different scales, right? These traditional centers are really providing the highest amount of, of yield per acre for, um, for what they are. Now, there are a number of things aside from the economics, I think, that we, we should consider here. And when we looked at Montpelier, uh, and looking at the uh, assessed property value per acre uh, compared to percentage of non-conforming properties, there was a very clear relationship, right? The higher value a property was, the more likely it was to be uh, non-conforming. So most of our downtown, uh, if it were to burn down, could not be rebuilt according to our zoning code, or at least our old zoning code. I'm hopeful that our new one can um, support that kind of uh, development. Um, uh, property values sort of before and after zoning uh, per road mile. You can see here after we enacted zoning, we were building um, at a value of one third of what we were before zoning. So you can imagine, you know, with our uh, requiring greater setbacks, road frontage, et cetera, we're using a lot more uh, infrastructure, taking up more space uh, than we used to for our, our traditional development patterns. And a lot of people uh, want to live in these areas. So there's a high demand. This is a, um, this was a, a survey done by RSG, uh, and 91 of respondents in Vermont said they would walk to um, school shopping or other activities if they lived close enough. And people want to live in small towns, right? So luckily, we're not. Um, we're not all sort of profit-seeking robots who would just move to uh, to big cities like New York City, right? Uh, we are willing to forego the maximum economic productivity to live in a place that, that we like. And a lot of people want to live 
in small towns. Um, and, then, and then we have a lot of just basic things, I think, going for us in Vermont. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about millennials in particular as, you know, wanting, needing to live in cities, et cetera, but they're not any different than uh, anybody in the sort of history of who we've been asking uh, as long as we have. What, what is the number one priority for where you want to live? Well, people want to be safe. Uh, people want good schools. Uh, people want uh, job opportunities. And we have those here in Vermont. We also have really good beer. <laughs> so we have a lot of the ingredients, I think, of, of what people want. And I see these all as, as big opportunities of things that we uh, have some control over um, in terms of who's going to, how we want our, our communities to look like. What are some game changers that are just going to maybe blow up everything that we know about um, the world? One was uh, mentioned earlier, self-driving cars and, and shared mobility. Um, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of development of these things um, outside of Vermont before they come here. But they're, I think it's hard to tell exactly how this would, would play out. Is it just going to be less expensive to live further out and you can just you know, get in your car and start doing your work and for your two-hour commute to wherever? Um, or is it going to be such that um, we have a huge opportunity in, in shared mobility and people not uh, needing to own cars and freeing up a lot of uh, these urban reserves that we have in our, our downtowns and our um, villages. So this is Montpelier, the areas in black is over 100 acres of parking, right? I mean, you don't need that parking space if you don't have a vehicle that needs to sit idle for 95% of the time. That opens up a lot of opportunity in our downtowns and villages. Um, then we have the Hyperloop, um, not on everyone's radar, but definitely on the radar of megalomaniac billionaires um, <laughs> who are competing to see who will build the first uh, Hyperloop. Uh, this is, I think, is uh, Richard Branson's company. Um, you can go on their website and punch in, um, you know, two cities, and it'll tell you how long it'll take for this uh, pneumatic tube, frictionless pneumatic tube, to fire you over to the other city. Uh, this is Boston to New York, and that's 26 uh, minutes. So if we think, about, um, we think about what the highway did in Vermont and how that led to Active 50 and a lot of uh, population growth, and, and what this might do, this is like with some traffic, like a four-hour trip down to 26 minutes. Uh, that could really radically change um, our landscape and where people live. If you can commute, you know, hundreds of miles within uh, a half hour, you know, that gives, it just changes our world. Uh, and then, of course, climate change. Uh, you know, one of the biggest issue we're facing right now, this is, this is just showing, you know, by tw 2100, our... Uh, uh, the Montpelier temperature for summers will be uh, 88 degrees, which is the equivalent of summers in, in North Miami. And um, you know, there's a lot for us to think about in terms of, we heard a little bit about insects and uh, in terms of extreme weather events and what does that mean for our tourism industry, et cetera. But uh, really the big big issue for me or that I uh, keep thinking about is, is sea level rise. And I don't know how many people took this quiz in the New York Times a, a few weeks ago? So it's asking you, you know, what, what state is this uh, given X amount of, of sea level rise? And I can't remember what the, the amount was. And um, it's just sort of mind blowing uh, to think about. And, and I'm going to end sort of on this, uh, this slide here, and not because I want it to be that, you know, depressing or. I think, but for me, when I look at it, it helps put what I'm trying to tackle into perspective. Uh, it, it seems a lot easier to deal with things like, oh, we can, oh, you know, fix what's wrong with Act 250 when you think about uh, <laughs> uh, trying to relocate, you know, millions of, of people or, or sea level rise. And my final thoughts, I mean, I think I, I just want to echo the re reoccurring theme that we've had uh, today and, and that David started started with is is we need to find that that shared vision and I think we've got a lot already there with our, our land use goals of our our compact settlements surrounded by working landscape we know it can 
help us address issues ranging from health to energy to uh, you know con wildlife habitat conservation to um, to clean water and really zeroing in on that and focusing not on identifying what we don't want but identifying what we do want and then making sure that we have the conditions in place for that to happen and that's going to go beyond just uh, adjusting our regulatory system, but uh, we need to look at things like our tax system and um, and a lot of like maybe weird ideas like we heard from Maryland, right? And and a key point, I think, to as we do that, uh, an important thing is really the relationships that we have with people and, and building a lot of those relationships and coming together in events like this and talking about those ideas uh, even if they're different than the ones we have. I think we really need to engage with each other and um, those relationships will help us be far more resilient when we do have things that are much bigger in terms of their impact on change like uh, what we saw with sea level rise there. Thank you. We might have a, a couple minutes for questions. Is there any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Speak up, I don't think you have a mic. Back in 1969, 70, one of Governor Davis's biggest advisors, a guy named Ian McCark, who was the father of Earth Day and GIS. Yeah, yes. Uh, from one uh, interviews I've done with people of that era, one of the reasons the statewide land use plan uh, did not emerge from committee was the you know, statewide zoning fear, but also because we didn't have the capability to map you know, biotic and abiotic resources and study ecosystems in such a way to make decisions. We've come a lot farther since then. Th there was an attempt in uh, Deer, um, Dover and Wilmington to do a, a bit of that, and, and they did have a plan, but so how much more robust is the capability of Vermont to do this kind of studying and mapping of, of, of resources, of, of ecosystems, because this is all about ecosystems. Environment's a big thing. Ecosystems in an area are pretty important, so how much more sophisticated and accessible is that today? Thank you. Um, that's a terrific question, and Mark, if you need to like yank me off the stage if I go for too long here, then we know. Um, we have such a tremendous wealth of information that is, that is literally coming online like right now, like, like last night. We're, we're working towards statewide uh, parcel data, which will have complete, which, which unlike out west, where we had those straight lines, the PLSS, it, we don't have that luxury here. It's a lot harder to, to map property boundaries in, in Vermont. We've just completed in the fall what's called statewide LIDAR. So how many people are familiar with uh, LIDAR technology? It's amazing. Um, <laughs> almost everyone in this room, uh, for the three that aren't uh, familiar with it, um, it's essentially, um, if you think of a bat and echolocation, we have planes that fly with lysars, and they'll send a pulse, a laser down, and get, get a, a very accurate uh, location on the Earth, an X, Y, and Z, Z, Z. I just outed myself as a Canadian um, <laughs> coordinate. Um, and we get multiple returns, one uh, the top of trees to the, the bottom of the Earth, and then we can run various algorithms to sort of strip all the buildings and trees off to understand our terrain as well as our surface modeling. Uh, and we are one of a handful of states that will now have statewide coverage uh, of this data. One of the first things we're doing with it now is generating uh, extremely high resolution land cover data. Uh, right now we have, uh, we used to have 30 meter resolution and a few years ago got 10 meter. We'll be going down to half meter resolution, which is close to 2,000 times more uh, accurate. Um, and I think we will be the first state that has that uh, data and information. I'm really excited about it. Uh, on top of that, we'll be extruding impervious surface and building footprints with height attributes, uh, tree canopy with height attributes. Uh, and it allows us to do a lot of uh, much more accurate hydrologic mod modeling um, in terms of floodplains and 
number of other and there's understanding our rivers a lot better so those are you know just a handful of of the things not to mention how much easier the technology is um, to work with and um, and how many more people know how to use it so 25 years ago uh, we had a user base of 128 uh, entities and we had someone who our entire database fit on on 12 floppy disks and someone people would fill out mail orders and send them in and uh, usually now is when someone says like I did that um, and, and send in the mail but uh, so um, and now as of just last year we had uh, 77,000 unique uh, users go to our geodata portal uh, we have over a thousand data sets in it and um, to think of that difference like 77,000 compared to uh, 128 in 25 years is, is massive. Um, and there are also um, the shift to using things as services as opposed to, um, we used to s send data, right? People used to download data. Now they stream data like you stream Netflix because these things are changing so quickly. So you wanna be able to get data directly from the source. So we've worked with the agencies to federate access to these authoritative data sources so that you could just stream them as things change. You don't need to you know, go try to get the new whatever data set you are actually looking at, whatever the freshest data is. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> John, is that, yeah, yeah, the executive director of the CCGIS, do you want to get any information on the CCGIS contact you're at? You can contact me at uh, john.e.adams at vermont.gov um, or uh, any of other means. You can just come talk to me. Uh, I'll, I'll be here in the afternoon. Um, yeah, people don't, don't talk to each other enough, especially not in my profession anymore. <laughs> Thank you, John. So now that John has given us lots to think about, um, I think it's turned to, time to turn the proceedings over to Rebecca Stone. Rebecca's been working with VPA uh, and the rest of the committee on, on this conference to facilitate or design a facilitation around, a, uh, around the afternoon breakout sessions. And I'll let Rebecca give us the lowdown on that. And um, I think just from a logistics perspective, um, there is a, a sign out sheet, there's a list outside that tells you where to go. If you're interested in a session, I think Rebecca will cover a little bit too. Great. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mark, and thanks to everybody. Um, you've just taken in a ton of information and data and opinions, and we're really excited now to flip that around, turn it over to you. It's time for VPA. And